Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 8680, Kraken Pinion. They ended your qualification matches at the Houston World Championship rank first in the Jemison division. Absolutely awesome team every single year, Into the Deep is no exception, and I can't wait to jump into them on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interests, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu slash first. StudiCut Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com slash robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. Okay, guys, so let's start with the intake. Very fast extension for those samples. Walk me through the transmission and how you're actuating this extension. All right, so our intake is driven by two Axon Maxes on a servo linkage, and they're connected on Misumi slides. So we have uh, one two-stage slide here and another three-stage slide. And that gives us just enough extension to get, like, to hit our extension limit and get about half, a little past halfway into the submersible. So we can run that real quick. Very nice, yeah. And I feel like I've seen teams with much longer intake extensions than you guys. Are you using that length instead in your deposit or why are you going for this length? You already mentioned that you're hitting those limits, but why sacrifice on the intake? We're using that length for specimen scoring functionality. So this outtake arm extends pretty far back when scoring specimens. And so that's why we're kind of limited in how far we can extend with the intake. Got it, got it, cool. Now jumping into the claw, you know, it's very, very quick. Walk me through some of the automations that really enable those fast sample pickups. Yeah, for sure. So we have on our claw, both bumpers allow the main driver to rotate the claw by in 45 degree increments. So we don't have to wait for it to rotate any certain amount. And as we drive up, can you hold the mic? All right. We can drive up to the samples and as we grab, it's an automated picking pickup sequence, and I can decide to reject by pressing circle, or I can grab and then transfer instantly. So you can see there, that's how our transfer process works. I can also choose to completely not do the whole weight sequence. So that back there. So I can grab instantly and do that. And that's if I know that other grab is good and I can start it early. Very cool. And talking about in autonomous a little bit, I see the limelight. How are you using that for your samples? Yep. So um, the limelight, we know we have it on a rigid mount on an angle here, and we do that so that it sees mostly the tops of the samples as it looks down. But we can also get a pretty good FOV since the limelight FOV is not the best FOV what we've experimented. We use a homography perspective transformation. So we set out an aluminum plate that's 12 by 12, and then map the homography points to, so that it essentially scales linearly as it um, between the top of the image frame and the bottom of the image frame. That allows us to get just the top views of the samples. And then we run a contour detection algorithm using ed by first identifying edges and then making contours with that. And then what we found that works best is we detect the samples based on which one ha which rectangle has the closest to the seven to three aspect ratio. So that's how we're able to identify only like Single, single samples and we can identify their position as accurately as possible. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And talking about like how this is uh, performed at Champs, what were there, was there a lot of tuning or doing the things like the aspect ratio and the homography just really, really helped so you didn't have to calibrate too much? So the main calibration was with the lighting because as uh, some peop many people know, the world's fields have very different lighting without overhead lighting. So we had to calibrate that. That's why a lot of times the lighting was a little bit inconsistent, the grabbing was a little bit inconsistent, but we kind of mitigated that by reducing things like the sensor gain, so that there's as little noise as possible and reducing our exposure. Oh yeah, jumping into the transfer, your transfer has been rock solid the entire tournament. What do you think are some of the biggest optimizations or lessons you learned while making this transfer so consistent? So one, one initially at the state championship, we had to wait for the sample to slide down inside this claw before retracting it because the outtake claw grabs ahead of the intake claw and they can't overlap because they're too large to do that. So what we did instead decided to do, instead of waiting for it to slide, we added a little backstop here for the outtake transfer and essentially the sample, it'll 
slam into it so we can run that real quick. So you can see it's not perfectly centered and uh, we can go. It slams into the backstop and then that essentially lets it, even if it grabs in a abnormal spot, it'll still be in the same spot every time when it's time to transfer. Awesome, yeah, as far as placing into, this, into the baskets go, teams have been filling them up just absolutely to the brim. You guys are no exception. What advice do you have for teams like figuring out how to balance those samples right at the top as far as driver practice goes and just becoming better at that? So what we've noticed that definitely helps and sets us apart a lot of the times is our fa the fact that our claw outtake can rotate to place the samples horizontally. Initially, we placed them vertically, and we noticed that we could pit a max of 16 or 17 consistently, and they'd frequently fall out after that. However, after adding the rotate functionality and then dropping them horizontally, we noticed we could get like 19, 20, even 21 very consistently. And that's helped get our cycles up a lot. Um, another thing is, as you, as a cycle, as you fill up the bucket more, it's better to take your time to go for the high bucket cycles. Even if it takes two or three more seconds than a low bucket cycle, it's still more, it's still worth it as you're not gonna get two of those in the same time, two low bucket cycles at the same time you're doing one high bucket. Yeah, absolutely. Jumping into the hang, I know you guys have a PTO. Mm -hmm. So walk me through what transmission you have before the PTO, after, and then after that, we'll jump into the actuation itself. Yeah, for sure. So initially, we have uh, on our main sides, we have two 435 RPM motors and they're sprocketed. So 14 or 10 to 14, they're the, it's a faster ratio. So essentially they move at 610 RPM and that doesn't get, that's not enough stall torque to hang. And we knew that from the start. So what we did is we implemented a power takeoff system that, so the main lift shaft runs through these two spools here and it chains to this shaft over here. And you can see a servo pivots down our, a coaxial PTO assembly into a high torque motor down here. And essentially that motor provides, to, pr transmits power through the gear train into the sprocket, into the main lift shaft. And that gives us enough torque that are to complete a level three assembly. Awesome, yeah. And as far as the hooks in that system goes, I see one set of hooks on this side, the other set over here. So are you going under the rung or how does that work? Yeah, so we saw a lot of teams um, would accidentally do level four ascents where they hunt hung on the bar so we wanted to be able to have the hooks go on the other side so that there's no chance of that happening in game because that would be fatal and so what we designed is these slides angle to go behind the bar after these slides have raised raised up for a level two yeah and do you have any features on the front of the robot to make sure you slide smoothly or was that not an issue for you guys so yeah we ensured that these uh the entire back of the robot is completely flat as we're going up so we don't have anything that could potentially block us. We made sure all the screw heads were, too, were short enough that everything would be good. Awesome, yeah, Crack and Pinion, just another fantastic season for you guys. Uh, so excited we could grab this behind the bot. Just really, really excellent robot, deep run in Houston. Uh, can't wait to see what you guys have for next season. Reporting for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abba Haas, and this is Team 8680, Crack and Pinion. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Studica Robotics is everything your team needs to build, learn, and compete. Check out their FTC starter kit, intake hub kit, and odometry wheel options at studica.com robots. Teams in the USA can get up to 25% off and apply for grants at studica.com robots. True competitors know that every second counts. That's why Kettering University challenges you to dive in right away as a first-year student. Participating in robotics programs helps Kettering students secure a valuable co-op. Whatever your interests, Kettering gives you more space to work faster and win faster. Learn more at kettering.edu first.